Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here GMAT Review, the official guide, the 13th edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. The book contains 230 problem solving questions. It has 174 data sufficiency questions. We have already solved every single math problem from this book. If you are interested in watching the solutions, uh, to uh, if you are interested in watching any of the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original original solutions from day number one through 250. Right now, we are in the process of reading the problem, and we are on page number 284. Let's turn to it. Page number 284, the very first problem on the page, problem number. 101. Let's see what it has to say. Problem number 101 is already on the blackboard. It says we are told that x is negative. The question simply is, is x less than negative 3? Well, let's find out, shall we? Let's see what they tell us in the first statement. The first statement, the first statement we are told that x squared is more than 9. x squared is more than 9. What we have to ask ourselves is, where would, we, where would we find this scenario to be true where the square of x is more than 9? It will happen actually in two places. If you look at the number line, if you look at the number line, here is our zero, here is one, two, three, here is positive three. If x happens to be, if x happens to be anything more than three, not including three, we're not including the point three. For example, if x happens to be positive four, of course positive four squared obviously is more than nine. But also, if x happens to be less than negative three, one, two, three, negative one, negative two, negative three, if x happens to be less than negative 3, again not, not including negative 3, we'll find that x squared will again be more than 9. For example, the square of negative 4 is 16, which of course is more than 9. So what this statement tells us is that x is either below 3 or x is above 3. That's all this statement tells us. But we mustn't forget that we are told in the problem itself, in the problem itself they tell us that x is negative. Now given the fact that x has to be negative, and we already know that it's got to be either more than 3 or less than negative 3, well then it has to be less than negative 3. But, uh, and the fact that x is, x is negative, we are told, the fact, the fact that x is negative, and x, this part tells us that x is either less than negative 3 or more than positive 3, putting the two statements together implies that x, that x must, be, must be less than negative 3. The question was, is x less than negative 3? And of course, we are, def we are able to give a definitive answer. Answer turns out to be yes. Yes, it is less than negative 3. The first statement by itself does the job quite nicely. First statement by itself is quite sufficient. A, D, B, C, E. A, D, B, C, E. Now that we have established the first statement by itself is sufficient, we know now, answer cannot be B, C, or E, it would have to be either A or D. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us that x cubed, x cubed is less than negative 9. Now does that, does that enable us to ascertain whether x is less than negative 3? The answer, alas, is no. Answer is no. It is not, this, this is not going to be enough. Had they told us, had they told us that x cubed is less than negative 27, now this would have done the job. If x is less, if x cubed is less than neg negative 27, then x would have to be. This would imply that x is less than negative 3. But they're not telling us negative 27. They're telling us negative 9. Negative 9 does not do the job. Negative 9 does not does not do the job. Here, there are a couple of situations I'm going to show you. For example, for example, for all we know, x could be x could be negative 4. In which case, the square of x is is positive 16, which is more than 9. Or rather, we're looking for cube. In which case, the cube, the cube of x, x would be negative four cube, which is going to be negative sixty-four, which is less than negative nine, which is negative sixty-four is less than nine. But x could also be, x could also be negative two and a half, for example. And do you know what the cube of negative two and a half is? Let's find out. Cube of negative two and a half. Well. 2 and a half negative squared, negative, negative 2 and a half squared, 
Think of two and a half as 25. 25 squared we know is 625. 625. Therefore, 2.5 times 2.5 is going to be 6.25 or 6 and a quarter. It's going to be positive 6 and a quarter. And then if you were to take the 6 and a quarter and multiply it by again negative 2 and a half, what will we get? Well, we can figure it out very quickly. 6 and a half times 2, 6 and a half times 2, 6 times 2 is 12 and half of quarter is 2 quarters. So we get 12 and 2 quarters plus 6 and a quarter times half. 6 and a quarter times half. What is half of 6 and a quarter? Half of 6 is 3 and half of a quarter is 1 eighth. And don't forget this is a negative quantity in front of us so this, this becomes negative. And what we end up here is 15. We end up with negative 15 negative 15 and this is 2 quarters which is same as 4 eighths, 4 eighths and 1 eighth is going to be 5 eighths. And of course we can clearly see that negative 15 is in fact less than negative 9. We certify the condition x cubed is in fact less than negative 9. This is, this is x cubed and x cubed is in fact less than negative 9 but x happens to be 2 and a half. x happens to be negative 2 and a half. So in this case the question was is x less than negative 3? In this case the answer is no because x here is not less than negative 3. The answer is no, it is not. Answer here is yes. Is x is x less than negative three? Here x is less than negative three because x was negative four. So here the answer is yes. There the answer is no. The second statement does not do the job. Second statement is not enough. Second statement is not enough. The answer is A. Only the first statement by itself does the job. The answer is A. Let's move on to the next problem. Next question. Problem number 102. It says how many can, how many canes fit in a how many can fit in a carton? How many fit a can fit in a carton? Let's see what they tell us about the cans. Let's see what they tell us about the carton. The first statement, the first statement tell, tells us that the interior, interior volume of the carton is two three zero four cubic inches. Do you think this is enough? Do you think this is enough simply knowing that the interior volume of the can uh, of the carton is two thousand three hundred and four cubic inches is that enough for us to be able to figure out how many cans will fit in the carton? Obviously not. Obviously not because we need to know we need to know the dimensions of the carton and we also need to know the dimensions of the can and they tell us neither without knowing the exact dimensions of the cartons and exact dimensions of the can we cannot ascertain how many cans are going to fit in this carton the first statement by itself is not enough first statement by itself is not enough A, D, B, C, E now that we have established that the first statement by itself is not enough we know now answer cannot be A or D it would have to be either B, C or E Let's look at second statement, shall we? Second statement tells us that each carton, each can rather, each can is six inches high and four inches in diameter. Again, simply knowing the dimensions of the can, if you look at the second statement by itself, that's what we're doing here. We're looking at only the second statement by itself. We have to forget everything that we read in the first statement, we must delete our memory. We are looking only at the information that is given in the second statement. Second statement gives us the dimensions of the can, but it tells you it tells us absolutely nothing at all about the dimensions of the carton. Therefore, second statement by itself cannot do the job. Second statement by itself cannot do the job. When we put them together, let's put them together. 
when we put the statement one and the statement together, in your haste, you might conclude that, well, now we know the dimension of the cane, we know exactly what the volume of the carton is, we can figure out the volume of this guy, divide this, uh, this total volume by the volume of one of the cans, and we can figure out how many cans will fit in the carton. Now, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're thinking, if your line of thinking is that, if that's what your line of thinking is, then I'm sorry, alas, you will end up picking the wrong answer. Simply knowing the volume of the carton does not do the job. We need to know the dimensions of the cartons. We still do not know what the dimensions of the cartons are. For example, for example, for all we know, if you put them together, we know that the carton, we are told, is 2,304 cubic inches. But how do we know? How do we know that this so-called carton, how do we know that this so-called carton is not 1 by 1 by 2,304 inches? 1 inch, 1 inch by 1 inch by 2,304 inches. It will be a pretty damn sleek carton, but as you can clearly see, in this situation, no canes will fit in. No canes will fit. Without knowing the exact dimensions of the cartons, it's, it's impossible to figure out how many cans are going to fit in that carton even if we know the dimensions of the can we need to know the dimensions of the can and we need, we need to know the precise dimensions of the carton itself the answer alas is E this thing is not getting us anywhere let's look at the next one problem number 103 problem number 103 Problem number 103 says that each letter, each letter assumes a value of 1, 2, or 3. This is very important for us to keep, our, keep in mind. Each letter can only have a value of 1, 2, or 3 and nothing else. It can be 0, it can be 4, it can be anything else. It has to be either 1, 2, or 3. We are also told that each number, each number appears only once in a given column or row. Each number appears only one in a given column or a row. In a given column or a given row, you will not see a repetition of a number. So if you see a two in one in one entry, then two will never appear in, this, in the same row or the same column. The question is very straightforward. The question is, how much is R? And of course, as we always, as I always remind you, questions are always straightforward. It is the answers that get tricky. The, 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 it is the answers that tend to get prickly. Let's look at, let's look at what they tell us. The first statement tells us that V plus Z equals 6. Now here's what's given to us. R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z. Now listen very carefully, okay? V plus Z, we are told, equals 6. Where is V? There is V and this is Z. V plus V plus Z. Just give me one second here. Here, the sum that is given to us cannot be cannot be, for example, we are told that V plus Z equals 6. The sum of these two numbers, for example, it doesn't matter whether it's V plus Z or Z plus V equals 6. It doesn't matter what order it is, but we know it cannot be six, 0 plus 6. It cannot be 0 plus 6. Why? Because 6 is not allowed. We can only have 1, 2, and 3. It cannot be 1 plus 5. It cannot be 1 plus 5 because 5 is not allowed. It cannot be 0 plus 6 because 6 is not allowed. 0 is not allowed. It cannot be 2 plus 4. Neither, neither Z, neither Z nor V can be uh, 2 because if one of them is 2, if either Z or V is 2, then the other one would have to be 4 because they have to add up to 6. 
but they are not allowed for. So what can we, what can they be? If they cannot be one, neither neither we listen very carefully. Neither we nor Z can be one. Neither we, neither we nor Z can be one, because if one of them was one, the other one would have to be five, and five is not allowed. Neither neither we nor Z can be two, because if one of them, either V or Z, either V or Z happens to be two, the other one would have to be four, because they have to add up to six. But four is not allowed. We are only allowed one, two, and three. What does this tell us? This tells us, this implies that both, both V and Z must equal three. V plus V and Z, they both equal three. That's the only possibility. That's the only way their sum is going to be six. That's the only way. Three plus six, three plus three is the only scenario that is feasible here. It cannot be any other. Neither V nor Z can be one or two. They cannot be one or two because if one of them was one, the other one would have to be five. Five is not allowed. If one of them was two, the other one would have to be four. Four is not allowed. They both must be three and three. Let's put it in here. V and Z. V and Z. So in, in place of, let's, let's put it in a different color. V has to be three and Z has to be three. Now let's see where that takes us. We're not done yet. This is, this, this is a bit tricky one. We're not done yet. I need the room. We need to put it up, up here. If V is equal to 3, if V is equal to 3 and, and Z is equal to 3, then the situation that we're looking at is this. Okay, listen very carefully. First look at V part right here. If v, this is, this is certain now. This is not a debate. This, this is V has to be 3. If V has 3, then either U is 1 and W is 2, or U is 2 and W is 1. And, and also at the same time, and also at the same time, I'm not writing here everything. If here's a here's a, a U and W. U and W. U and W. Either U is 1 and W is 2, or U is 2 and W is 1. And at the same time, and at the same time, the fact that z is 3, that tells us that tells us that here's our x and y, x and y. If z is equal to 3, then either x is 1 and y is 2, or x is 2 and y is 1. Same exact thing as before. Either x is 1, in which case y is 2, or x is 2 and y is 1. But what do we notice? What do we notice? We are interested in knowing if it's possible to figure out what r is. Well, there are only two possibilities. There are only two values that you can be. You can be either one or two. If u happens to be one, v will be uh, w will be two. If u happens to be one, w will be two because v is only three. Because no repetition is allowed. Remember that we cannot allow a rep we are not allowed a repetition. Similarly, if z is three, which we know it is, z is three. In which case, either x is one and y is two, or x is two and y is one. Again, because the repetition is not allowed. But in all possible scenarios, what we notice is that the only value that u can take is either 1 or 2. The only values that x can take is 1 or 2. Neither u nor x, that's, we're getting really close to the punchline, okay, pay attention. Neither u nor x can be 3. Neither u nor x can be 3. Therefore, r must be 3. r has to be 3. Because there are only three possible values we are allowed, 1, 2, and 3 and no other values, and no repetition is allowed. So if this guy is either 1 or 2, and this guy is either 1 or 2, R must be 3. The first statement does the job quite beautifully. The first statement is enough. A, D, B, C, E. Now that we established the first statement by itself is enough, we know now, answer cannot be B, C, or E. Answer would have to be either A or D. Let's move on to second statement, shall we? Now in a problem like this, in a problem like this, if you're running out of time and if it takes too much time to analyze one statement, there is no shame in flipping a coin and moving on to the next problem. Just do half the work, raise your ass to 50-50, just pick one answer choice and move on. If you have to, if, if the time is running out, there is no shame in it. 50% chance on a question such as this one is a damn good chance. Let's look at a second statement. Second statement tells us, 
Second statement, or oh, second statement, second statement is another tricky one. It tells us that s plus t plus u plus x equals six. We need we need the room and we're done with all of this thing. And we have to erase all of this thing because uh, none of these none of these scenarios apply now. We're looking at second statement by itself. So R S T U V W X Y and Z. We are told that S plus T plus U plus X. What we have to understand immediately is that we are interested in S, which appears right here, and you, uh, the other thing that appears in the row is T, S plus T, right here. This is the pair we are interested in, and U plus X right here. U plus X. We are told that S plus T, S plus T, plus U plus X equals 6. Equals 6. But we also know that each row in each column has to add up to 6. Each row in each column must add up to 6. Just give me one second. Each, each row in each column must add up to 6. Where is it? Each each letter of the above table represents one number. Each number appears exactly one. Now, how do we know that each column and each row must add up to 6? That's an important question. How do we know that? Because it says nowhere in the problem. I just checked. It does not say anywhere in the problem that each row and each column must add up to 6. So how do we know that that's true? Because there are three entries here. One, two, and three. Three entries in each column in each row and we are allowed only three values. 1, 2, and 3, in any order obviously, but 1 plus 2 plus 3, it doesn't matter what order, you order, what order you put it in, the three letters, because of the fact that they only allow the value of 1, 2, and 3, the three of them together, their sum has to be exactly 6. Which tells us that, which tells us that R plus S plus T, R plus S plus T has to equal 6. It also tells us that R plus U plus X, R plus U plus X, also has to be 6, which means that R plus S plus T has to equal R plus U plus X. Are you with me? This implies, this implies that R plus S plus T has to equal R plus U plus X. But R appears on both sides. We can get rid of it. That means that S plus T must equal U plus X. And they are equal to 6, which means S plus this implies, this in turn implies that S plus T must equal to 3 and U plus X must equal to 3. Are you still with me? If S plus T is 3, if S plus T is 3, but there's only, there are only two ways that is possible. There are only two ways that is possible. Either S is 1 and T is 2 or two, S is 2 and T is 1, just like before. There are only two possibilities here. If their sum has to be If there's some, if s plus t equal, if s plus t is equal to three, if s plus t is equal to three, there are only two possibilities: it's either one and two, or two and one. It doesn't matter whether it's s is two and t is, s is one and t is two, or the other way around. It doesn't matter. The point is, if one of them is one and the other one is two, then r has to be three. Voila, r must be three. Same exact logic will apply with u and x. U and x equals three u plus x we are told right here u plus x we are told is 3 u plus x which means either u is 1 and x is 2 either u is 1 either u is 1 and x is 2 or u is 2 and x is 1 or u is 2 and x is 1 it doesn't matter whether it's 2 or 1 it doesn't matter whether x is 2 or 1 the fact that in a given column or given row no repetition is allowed if these two are guys are one, are taking the value of one and two, R has to be three. Second statement does the job quite nicely also. The answer here is D. The answer is D. Each statement by itself, each statement by itself does the job quite nicely. Now listen, I was planning to do all these questions in one shot, but I'm having a second thought now. I mustn't keep on going because it's going to be a very long video if I were to do that. So I'm going to stop here and making six problem in one video is going to be very long. And we'll do the, we'll pick up from 104 
in the next video. Okay? Bye now.